morning and welcome to New Hope. Today we're going to continue our series on relationships, our two-week series. Last week we sort of looked at it a bit more from the marriage angle, although it's not about being married or single or whatever. Um, this week we're going to look at it a little bit more from the single level, although it's not really about being married or single or whatever. One big caveat out of the way before we get started. I am not single. I've never really been single. I was uh, living at home until I was 23, going to school, moved from the parental home into the married home. Yeah. So preaching on singleness puts me on very, very, very thin ice in terms of really understanding, authentically understanding what I'm talking about, which you may think, yeah, there's nothing new in that, John. This week, I finished reading, which is uh, sort of the secondary text, the biblical text and then this text. Uh, for me in uh, learning about this topic, a book called Loves Me, Loves Me Not, written by Laura A. Smith. It says on the front, highly recommended. I highly recommend it, uh, especially if you're living and trying to make sense theologically and faith-wise of the whole idea of singleness and marriage. It helps uh, in both cases. Laura Smith, I met her a couple months ago, no singleness. She's 40-something. She's never been married. She's uh, figured she's probably going to be single for the rest of her life. So she writes out of that place. She works at a college with a bunch of single young adults uh, who are still figuring out where they're going to end up relationally and discerning that. And so she knows the life, uh, the single life, young and old. When I first picked up her book, I was a bit perplexed because I attended her workshop on singleness. And then all of a sudden she recommends this book and I pick it up and I was perplexed by the title, uh, Loves Me, Loves Me Not. And it was only as I engaged the text, started reading it, that I discovered exactly why she entitled it in that way. The book is filled with anecdotes and quotes from real-life people who are trying to work their way through the reality of a single life, many of them struggling with that reality. In her intro, she quotes one person who says, No, she sets it up first, and then she starts to quote people. One woman in her 40s says, I think that one of the most difficult things about being single for this long is not the being single, like everyone thinks, it's how many times you have to live through the pain. That is, the pain either of being rejected or having to reject someone. Sometimes this rejection happens before there is any relationship to speak of, and we need to deal with the loss of a dream. Sometimes rejection means the end of a long relationship for which we once had high hopes. Another young man wrote about pursuing a young woman who would not be wooed, quote unquote. He says he tried everything, not poetry, not music, not vulnerability. I thought, oh boy, if you've got to try to turn on vulnerability, you're in trouble, buddy, already. But this is what he writes, not poetry, not music, not vulnerability. My usual tactics had absolutely no effect on her. I was completely lovesick. I burned with passion for her. The more she pushed me away, the more I longed for her. I continued to pursue her, thinking she'll come around sometime or another. I even drove hundreds of miles to see her. The startling lesson this young man learned, Smith writes, is, was that his tactics were not foolproof. Only after a long period of persistence did he finally give up saying, I couldn't take it anymore. I remember reading his quote and son of, you know, 20 years later sort of going, come on guy, grow up. But then I remember when I was 16 and Diana Roncoma said no to me like eight times in a row and I punched a hole in my bedroom door, which I had to cover with a Farrah Fawcett poster, the one in her red bathing suit. (laughs) Serious. No, but I know the anxiety of that rejection a little bit, I guess. A couple more quotes. A woman writes, we emailed, talked on the phone, but still no conversation about our friendship or moving into a relationship. We were not physically involved, not holding hands or kissing or anything like that, but in my heart, I just wanted something to work out. I would pray and I asked God to prepare both of our hearts. And then another writes, frankly, I thought we would get married someday. 
And when he finally shared his feelings, she told him that she was still in love with someone else. And then he writes, I was crushed. I didn't understand. I felt that God had lied to me. I kept struggling, th though, and eventually, through some miracle, came to understand that sometimes we just don't know God's will as much as we think. And the book was just filled with story after story talking about unrequited love. A love that is offered to somebody, but it's not received by them. Or a love that's given, the most vulnerable thing you can do, and they reject you. Spurned. Ignored. Unnoticed. Which is painful for any human being. Married, single, whatever, right? And in some ironic and mysterious way, unrequited love is one of the ways that we as human beings are like God. Surely, God is first in line when it comes to experiencing the spurning and the rejection and the unnoticing of His love. Prophet Isaiah, speaking for God, wrote, but now this is what the Lord says, and feel God's heart in this. This is God's heart for his people, right? This is God's heart for his people in that biblical time, but this is God's heart for his people, for you, for me, for everyone. But now this is what the Lord says, he who created you, he who formed you. Quote, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. You are precious and honored in my sight. I love you. I am with you. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I'm doing a new thing, God says. Now it springs up. Don't you perceive it? I'm making a way, the people I formed for myself, that they may proclaim my praise. And yet, you have not called on me. You have not wearied yourself for me. You sort of picture God, you know, and yet she's not returning my calls. He's not even noticing how I feel this way for him. God is a God who knows love spurned. Yes. 